So I am absolutely delighted to finally get to meet Mike Fry in person. He has come a long way to be with us and to talk about how we can, in Pueblo, get to a no-kill community. I think everyone in this room is here because that's what we believe in, that's what we want to see, and we know we can do it. So Mike Fry is here to help us do just that. Come on up, Mike. Well, thanks so much, Shanna. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, there's few things that I enjoy doing uh, more in my life than talking to groups of people who are on the cusp of important social change. Because um, I love animals, I love animal shelters, I love everything about it, but social change is one of my biggest passions. And so tonight, I believe you are, Pueblo is on the verge of a dramatic transition. I'm going to talk specifically about what got you here a little bit, um, what that transition is, and what comes next in that process, which is why we're talking about getting to know Phil, how this important social change movement is going to take hold. And I always put that in the context of um, creating a culture that's centered on life saving. I think most people, if they followed anything about what's been going on in Pueblo, knows that there really hasn't been a culture that's focused or centered on life-saving. Um, but you're, you're really on the cusp of it. I mean, city council in Pueblo passed the Pueblo Animal Protection Act. That's a huge step. Um, where it's going to go from here um, will be interesting to see. Um, before we go further, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, so that when I say all that stuff about what I think is going to happen, you'll believe me. <laughs> um, I've been um, in this industry for about 20 years, and I led um, Minnesota's first no-kill animal shelter uh, for 15 years. Um, it was the first open admission animal control center in, in Minnesota, actually. Um, I also was the former executive producer and co-host for Animal Wise Radio, a nationally syndicated radio program. And in that capacity, I had the privilege of talking to shelter directors from all over the United States. And so all of that learning and all that information um, I've absorbed and um, hopefully we'll be including some of that in this presentation as well. I'm currently the founder and chief consultant for No Kill Learning, an organization that goes around to animal shelters and teaches them how they can flip the No Kill switch on. And it really is very much that way. It's like turning on a light switch. You can go from one day killing 50% of the animals at the animal shelter to the very next day stopping doing that. And I'm going to show you some specific examples of places where that has actually happened. Like literally, overnight, the light switch flipped on. And I believe we're getting ready to flip that switch in Pueblo. Um, I also um, am the former clinic coordinator for the Wildlife Rehabilitation Clinic and the Wildlife uh, Rehabilitation Manager at the Howell Wildlife Center. So prior to getting into domestic animals, I was working in wildlife, and so you know um, why I have all these white hairs. <clears throat> a handful of things that I've actually done during that process, just as an FYI, I created the first no-kill communities in Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, helped countless other communities achieve no-kill status, um, created the first trap neuter release program in Minnesota, and on and on and on. Um, not, none of it's really worth talking about too much, just to know I have been around the block more than a few times, and um, I'm really uh, particularly motivated to come and talk to groups like yours that are at the place that you're in, in um, that transition phase. Um, before we go any further, I think it's important that we define and talk clearly about when I say no kill, what do I mean? You know, in the world of animal sheltering, there's a lot of misinformation about that. And in fact, as I followed the story here in Pueblo, some of the people, even in the animal sheltering world, haven't really um, talked about it in terms that are uh, the true definition of what no-kill typically is. So what I say no-kill means is that it reserves humane euthanasia for terminally ill and seriously dangerous animals. So those animals that are truly suffering, that have no other place to be, um, we fully believe and support in euthanizing those animals, but no other animals at all. 
collectively, that group of animals that needs euthanasia services in a humane way is 5% or less than the total intake of the animal at, at an animal shelter. They're less than 5% typically. Um, just to be gracious, the no-kill movement gives wiggle room of 5% to the newbie shelters that have just turned no-kill. And so that's where that 90% number comes from. So there's a misnomer out in the world that a no-kill shelter is one that achieves 90% live release rate or higher. But that's not really true. A no-kill shelter is one that commits to saving every savable pet, every healthier, treatable pet, um, and the 90% live release rate is a measure to how well they're doing on that benchmark. So you could be at 92%, but if you're still killing some healthy and treatable animals, you're not no-kill. So that's the important distinction there. Um, but typically, you're going to see 90% save rates or higher for, no, for shelters if they're no-kill, um, particularly the newbie shelters. Once they get their feet wet and are fully in there, they're gonna, you're going to see 95, 97. Just next door in Fremont County, they're seeing 97, 98%. So all of those things are very possible. And it's worth pointing out that on June 1st of 2001, there were zero no-kill communities in the United States, not a one. But that changed on June 11th, 2001, when Nathan Winograd walked in the door at the Tompkins County SPCA in Ithaca, New York, and said, this, the killing stops today, and it did. Again, one of those magic stories where overnight it changed. And currently, there's about 140 no-kill communities in the United States. And because some of those communities are counties that have many cities in them, there's about 500 no-kill cities in the United States. And the map of that looks something like that. Well, not something like that. That's them. And I would like you to pay particular attention to this giant cluster in Colorado. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Colorado has done some really remarkable things, largely in part to the important work of people like you know, Bill Colorado and spin-offs like Reform Pueblo Animal Services. Why those efforts are so important and why there's, you know, labeling of those groups as being quote-unquote divisive and stuff, we'll talk about in a little bit, but clearly something magic has been happening in Colorado. You can't ignore it by looking at the map. <clears throat> um, the other thing about this map that's interesting, there's two perspectives. You can look at this map from my perspective, old man Mike's perspective, that remembers way back in the olden days when there were no dots on this map. I mean, literally, June 11, 2001, there were no dots on that map. And I have been working in this field for a very long time. And since June 11, 2001, these dots have been slowly filling in um, and speeding up as time goes on. And the, the important thing to know about that is that dots don't come off that map. So this is clearly an indication that the no-kill movement is a phenomenon. This industry is in rapid transition. And so that's the context that I want to have for the rest of this conversation. We're talking about an industry that's changing very, very rapidly. Uh, and so that's my perspective. I look at that and go, wow, look at all those no-kill communities. Other people can look at that map and say, wow, how come they're so few? I mean, and to be clear, that's not a map of no-kill shelters. That's a map of where communities where all of the shelters are not done. If we put no-kill shelters on the map, it would be all blue, because there's usually a no-kill shelter in every community. So you know, anyway, that's, that's what all I have really had to say about that. To understand why there's so few and why things are changing so fast, we have to go back in time a little bit. A couple hundred years, in fact, when animal control first started in the United States, it was almost entirely a rabies control effort. The job, as it was described to the pound master, was to go round up stray dogs and kill them. You know, in New York, they would literally put the dogs in these giant cages and drop them off the end of the Brooklyn Bridge, the Brooklyn Pier, in order to drown them. I mean, they did it openly in the public. That was the job. 
Um, it was a catch and kill model almost entirely. And it wasn't really until about 2001 that things have really started changing. So if you think back to where the quote unquote sheltering industry has come from, that's the roots of it. And that's the mindset that we're working to shift and change. Um, and so from that perspective, you can see how far we've come and that we still have a long ways to go. If you want to see the full history, it's detailed very well in Nathan Winograd's book, um, Redemption, The No-Kill Revolution in America. There's also a DVD, a film that you can get at Amazon.com or stream it live, Redemption, The No-Kill Revolution in America. Highly recommend it. Goes far more into detail about the history. And as long as you understand really where we've been, it's easier to understand the people in the shelters now who still have the mindset that animal control is about public safety, and animal control is about rabies control, and animal control is about catching and killing animals. Um, so it, as long as you understand that history, it's easier to get where we want to go. So highly recommend those two things. So um, want to talk a little about so each of those little dots. I wish I could tell the story of every single one of those blue dots on that map, but I, I picked a handful of those that are my favorites. Um, this one, Segoville, Texas, um, Sergeant Carl Daly, just an amazing guy. Segoville, Texas is this tiny little rural town in Texas. And um, this is going to be relevant in a little bit, but um, like many animal shelters, their animal control was operated by public health. Um, and it had been a hot potato because they were killing a lot of pets. Nobody liked to do it. The public was angry about it. So control the animal shelter kind of was getting passed around from this you know, municipal agency to another. Well, it was being transferred from public health into public safety. And guess what? Ding, ding, ding. Carl Bailey, you're up. You're going to be in charge of animal control. Carl Bailey says, no, I'm not. Uh-uh. Not doing it. I'm an animal lover. I can't do that. They said, oh, no, you are. You're going to be in charge of the animal shelter. Carl Bailey says, no, I'm not doing that. I refuse. Um, long story short, after three go-rounds, they said, no, you are going to do it. He said, I don't care. Well, if I'm going to do it, then it's going to be a no-kill shelter. Carl Bailey, at that moment, had only heard that there was some notion that there were no-kill shelters out there in the world didn't know how they did it, didn't know what the programs were, had never heard of the no-kill equation. He just knew he wasn't going to kill any animals. So he walked into the uh, animal shelter day one, and the story goes, Carl Bailey walked in at 9 o'clock. At 9.02, he told the staff, the killing stops. At 9.03, they dismantled the gas chamber. He ended that first year not knowing what he was doing with a 98% live release rate, and they've been no-kill ever since. I mean, think about that. And Carl Bailey's just the nicest, kindest, warmest gentleman you ever want to meet. Had the privilege of interviewing him a few times. Right next door to Pueblo, you've got Fremont County. I spent the morning with uh, Doug Ray, an amazing individual. What many people don't remember is that for years, the Fremont County Humane Society was in great distress. They were you know, on the front page of their newspaper for killing animals needlessly, repeatedly, on and on, day after day after day. And after years of distress, the board decided to bring in a new director. And that new director was Doug Ray. And the day Doug Ray arrived, boots on the ground, and at the Humane Society of Fremont County, they became one of the highest saving shelters in the United States, frequently seeing live release rates of 96, 97, 98%. And it's happening literally right next door. I made the drive today, and I was like, holy cow, you go from Pueblo County into Fremont County. They're just like right over there. And I guarantee you, Doug is a nice guy. I even asked him if they need help over in Pueblo. Would you would you help him? He was like, of course I would help him. And he's literally right next door. And again, light switch flipped on, and they became one of the uh, top saving shelters in the United States. Um, Missioner Leslie Campion, 
interesting individual. Um, Lake County, Florida is central rural Florida. So if you go to Orlando and go north towards the Alligators, um, that's where Lake County is. It's, it's farm country. It's very rural. It's, um, no one would ever use the term progressive to describe Lake County. Nice people, wonderful people, an incredibly high intake to their very rural animal shelter, and lots of serious issues with animal abuse, animal cruelty. They do like bear baiting and all kinds of uh, sports that involve cruelty to animals in Lake County. And their shelter has an intake that's nearly twice that national average. And they were killing about 50%. And like many animal shelters, um, the shelter had been a hot potato. Um, the Board of County Commissioners in Lake County used to run the animal shelter, and it was a bloodbath. Uh, people called it a bloodbath. Um, they got so sick of all the controversy, they handed control of the animal shelter over to the sheriff's office. So it was, you know, now then being run by the sheriff's, the sheriff's department, and it got a little bit better in a couple of areas, got worse in a couple of other areas, and the fighting and the stress and the struggle um, continued um, until one day, Leslie Camp Young gave me a call. She was in a long car ride with the county manager, and they were like, let's call Mike Brock and talk to him about the shelter. <laughs> and uh, that was in November um, of 2016. They decided to take control of the shelter back again, and they just they ended up taking it, taking control of the shelter January 15, 2017. Um, and by that time, we had put together an entirely new team, um, put together new practices, policies, and protocols. They handed the keys over to our team January 15, and there hasn't been a healthier, treatable animal killed at that animal shelter ever since. I mean, absolutely amazing. This is, and they take in 7,000 animals a year in this small rural shelter in a building that's really just a glorified pole barn. I mean, it was never built for the kinds of work that they're doing now. Absolutely amazing story. Um, and the key thing, one of the reasons I wanted to tell you those stories is because there's actually a, a model, a paradigm, an archetype for all of these transitions. They all follow the same path. Um, it, it, it's not like an aberrant thing here and there. You can see it happening as it's happening in real time. Um, the old style shelter becomes a hot potato issue that gets tossed around. Nobody wants to manage it or control it because the reality is that since the industry is changing, the public expectations for the shelter are changing too. So it used to be that dog catchers could catch and kill animals and people were not happy about it, but they didn't make a fuss about it. But as the animal sheltering world has gotten better, people's expectations have gotten more. And so those shelters, nobody wants to be associated with the killing anymore. And so the shelter gets bounced around and they, you know, the animal advocates demand change. And that demand for change causes stress and struggle. And I would argue that stress and struggle is the most important part of that process. Because if that stress and struggle wasn't there, the powers that be in those positions wouldn't change anything. They absolutely wouldn't. And so when you see that stress and struggle occurring, you know there's something going on. We're going to talk in more detail about that and why it's important in a bit, so I'll just leave that alone for now. And what's really particularly interesting is once they achieve no-kill, all of that stress and struggle goes away. You know, in Pueblo, that would mean no more stories on the front page of the chieftain. Or if there were front page stories on the front of the chieftain, it would be about celebrations because the shelter just reached a new milestone in high live release rates. It would be an entirely different presentation to the community. And as a result, the shelters become a focal point for support and celebration within the community. Now in Lake County, that old, ugly pole barn that was never built to be a decent shelter is being replaced with a new state-of-the-art $7 million facility 
that these very rural, very conservative Republicans all voted unanimously to spend the money on it because they're so proud of their shelter, they want it to be a nice place. They're literally breaking ground on the two-year anniversary, January 15th this year. It's going to be one heck of a party, let me tell you. And support for the shelter grows. And it's worth pointing out that never in all of the years I've been doing this work have I talked to an individual at any level in any animal shelter that has made the transition to no-kill that says that they would like to go back to the way it used to be. It just doesn't happen. So not only are the dots filling in the map in the right direction, nobody wants to go back. So when I say this is an industry that's changing and it's only going one direction, all of the evidence is there to prove that to be true. There is only one direction that this is going. And all of the people in this room are a part of that important change in the <clears throat> To listen to some of the people who are writing letters to the editor in the chief and things, or you know, look around the United States, um, you would think that there's some sort of controversy about the no kill equation or achieving no kill. So just to make sure that we know that there isn't any, I'm just going to very quickly go through what they are. There's 11 programs in the no kill equation, and individually, when you sit down and look at them, there's nothing really controversial about any of them. Nearly any animal shelter in the United States, if you sat down and talked to them about these 11 things, there's not one thing that they would say, well, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and so here's what those look like. Um, the first one, trap, neuter, release. Yay! It's way better to sterilize feral cats than bring them into a shelter and kill them. You actually change the population dynamics of the animals out on the streets and in the forests um, so that they don't produce kittens. And that reduces the population in a humane way and reduces intake to the shelter. So it's humane, reduces intake, increases live outcomes really not rocket science. It works everywhere. They're even using it in places like the Galapagos Island with sensitive wildlife because it's more effective than catching and killing. <laughs> Comprehensive adoption programs, critically important. Nobody could possibly say that they're not important, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into them because there's a unique phenomenon in, well, in, in Pueblo because many of your most adoptable pets here are actually going up to Colorado Springs for adoption, and that's really not a good thing, because I think about adoptions as, okay, you're adopting a pet out, that's really good, uh, but there's more benefits to it than that, because you're also, with each adoption, you're including a microchip, you're including a spay or neuter, almost certainly, and so that one adoption actually encompasses many of the no equation components. And if you adopt that animal into your own community, you're building a bridge to a person in that community, and you're making sure that more of the animals in your community are sterilized. And if you have very friendly adoptions, you can actually reduce the number of animals that are coming from pet stores and puppy mills because the, the shelter becomes the place to get animals. And so when you really grow the number of adoptions from the animal shelter, all of a sudden, the adoptions are, are more. The numbers coming from breeders and other commercial sources goes down. And the number of sterilized animals in the community goes way, way up. And so there's really an important reason to keep as many of the adoptions going on locally in your community as you possibly can, because you get not a two fur, you get a three or four fur for each one of those adoptions that you keep local. <laughs> um, low cost spay neuter. I don't think anybody could possibly argue that that's important. Important part of the no-kill equation as well. Rescue groups, coordination with those. It shouldn't even be just a matter of being open and receptive to rescue groups. Shelters can actively reach out to them. One of the most interesting turnarounds I ever watched was in St. Paul, St. Paul Animal Control. They had been running about 60% live release rate for years. They had a gentleman who ran the place who was a really nice guy who had taken the job literally 40 years ago. And 40 years ago, Bill Stevenson was a visionary. But, you know, he'd been in the job for 30 years when he retired. When he retired, they hired a new director named Molly Linares. 
they couldn't do most of these programs. The city didn't have a budget. She would have had to go before city council, get all stuff approved. She said, well, there's one thing I can do is I can proactively work with rescue groups. So every day, Molly would sit down with her computer and she output a spreadsheet, including photos of every animal that was in the shelter, and she emailed it out to all of her rescue partners. Said, building football, come and get them. Oh, and by the way, if you have a hard time getting here and you want me to deliver, I will put them in my car and I will drop them off at your house. And literally, overnight, their live release rate went to about 94%. They didn't do any of the other stuff. They just actively, proactively, and very enthusiastically embraced the rescue groups and changed, turned the place around with just that one program. Foster homes? Is there anybody in the world that would argue that foster homes and an animal shelter aren't important? Of course they are. Uh, pet retention programs. This is one of the most important things. I could do two hours just on pet retention programs. So people show up at the shelter, you know, they're wanting to surrender their pets. What do you do? Do you have people check a little box on a form, take it, and then fill it? Or do you sit down with those people to try to figure out why they're surrendering the pet? Well, what you should do is sit down with those people and try to figure out why they're getting rid of their pet and see if you can help them solve the problem. Again, not commonly done in many animal shelters, but certainly not a particularly controversial thing to do. Rehabilitation, that's behavior and medical. Um, and I'll just, you know, just because you're probably a little bored with just sitting there looking at me. Oops, sorry. There's a, there's a fun little video here. One of my favorite things about, um, let's see if I can get this video to play. One of my favorite things about animal shelters is um, play groups for puppies. I'll describe them just a little bit as you can watch this video. First two dogs are little puppies. Every other dog you're gonna see in this video was labeled dog aggressive, just so you know. And this is really, a puppy play groups is really just putting a bunch of dogs together in an outside yard and letting them play. Um, and it's not only therapeutic for the dogs, as in it helps them to become better canine citizens, it's also diagnostic because when you get animals out in play groups, you can find out that this dog who's snarky and barky and lungy in the kennel, when you get them outside, they run and play like this. So it can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. And I would argue these sorts of things um, actually um, help with other areas of the shelter too, like staff retention, volunteerism. I mean, if this is your job, who wouldn't want to show up to it? If, if that's what you can go do as a volunteer, I can go out and I can exercise 20 dogs at once. Like, who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, it's just a blast. Well, I could show dog play groups all day. Um, but again, nothing particularly controversial. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? You have a little scuffle between dogs, and if they're being supervised, then you go, oh, we, can, we just learned something here about this dog. You know, it's, again, diagnostic and therapeutic. Eighth program, engaging the public. So since the beginning of time, since animal control first started as rabies control, the story was people are bad, they don't vaccinate, so we're going to round up and kill their animals. And then it became, oh, we have to kill the animals because of pet overpopulation, because of the irresponsible public, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that entire conversation has done nothing but push the public away from the animal shelter. You know, it's really hard to be snarky and punitive and punishing of people um, while you're asking for their support. And so what the shelters really need to do is flip the mindset around so that they're proactively engaging their shelters in constructive ways and not scolding ways. Um, and have fun events like Cinco de Miao or whatever. Whatever you need to do, to, and not just to engage the public, engage your staff, engage your volunteers, engage your city council members in this positive, fun, um, engaging sort of conversation. Instead of 
um, what they've typically been doing. Um, volunteers, would, that's program number nine. Who would not, who would argue you don't need volunteers? Of course you need volunteers. And if you do volunteers right, you can find volunteers who will volunteer to be vet techs on your surgery days. You can find volunteers who will perform nearly any function of the animal shelters. I know animal shelters where they literally hand keys up to the shelter to the volunteers, so they have full access to every inch of that building 24-7. You can, with volunteers, do practically anything. I worked in Hurricane Katrina. Literally thousands and thousands of people, you know, in an organized way, breaking into people's homes, you know, in dangerous situations. And there wasn't a lot of problems related to it because by and large, you can trust people to do the right thing if you provide them with the right support and training. Proactive redemption. It's a no-brainer. You're an animal control officer out in the field. You pick up a stray dog. Uh, what do you do? Do you put it in your truck and bring it right to the shelter? Or do you scan it for a microchip right there? And then see if you can find the owner. Or do you knock on the doors in the neighborhood and say, does this dog look familiar? Do you post a sign? you know, where it was found, indicating that this dog was found, that it was taken to the animal shelter. All of those things are things every animal control officer should do. Because if you can get the animal returned home without coming to the shelter, you're reducing the fees, making it easier for people to get their pets back. And guess what? When an animal control officer knocks on your door and says, hey, I just found your dog, they become a community resource that is loved instead of the dog catcher that everybody hates. Um, it's a complete change of mindset. <clears throat> and the most important of them all, effective leadership. When Nathan McGrath published his book, Redemption, he actually called it compassionate director. Um, but for reasons you'll understand soon, um, I realized it's not really about a compassionate director. I mean, sure, compassion is part of that, um, but there's a lot more than compassion that's needed. There's an entire profile of leadership that's required, and it's not just the director, it's the entire leadership structure. Um, in a municipality, that means city council, in a county, it's the county board, it's that entire leadership structure that needs to get synced up in order to bring about no kill. So I rebranded that compassionate um, director piece into the And I don't think there's anybody who could argue that isn't important for no kill either. And so with that, that's the entire no kill equation. So think about that. Shelters all over the United States are running around saying it's controversial. It's like if you even mention it to them, their hair is on fire, it's scary. It's, but there's nothing remotely controversial about it at all. And so that's where we are. And I would argue in your community, you have an amazing resource in Reform Pueblo Animal Services. They have gone so far down this path that they produced their own community assessment about what's been happening at Pueblo Animal Services. It's the kind of document that if you hired me or any of the other consultants to come out and present to you, would cost $20,000 in that range. And they did it for free. Um, I went through this document and stand by it 100%. have seen not all of the documents that are connected to the creation of it, but some of them. And it's clear that they've done their homework and a good job. I highly recommend, if any of you are interested in seeing or knowing about it, there, I believe there's copies of it in the back room. Um, I've got other ways that um, we can get you copies of it if you want to see it. But that's an amazing thing, an amazing asset that you have in your community. And before we go into the next pieces, I just want to clearly indicate, just clearly say that no-kill money just works out. People always think you have to bring in a boatload of money in order for no-kill to work. In fact, there is no extra money that you need. Because if you think about it, um, killing animals, catching, pulling, killing animals is 100% revenue negative. Um, well, you know, giving them to rescue groups saves you money. You don't have to hold them so long. 
You don't have to kill them or dispose of them, that costs money. So releasing to rescue saves money. Um, releasing to TNR costs nothing and saves money. Adoptions generate revenue and goodwill and donations. Proactive redemption saves money. It actually pays for itself if you look at the equation in detail. So this whole idea that you need a bricks truck to pull up to your shelter in order to do this is just simply not true. So it is, with that, I'm just gonna say, I firmly believe, with all that being said, that Pueblo is going to be next on this map. And I'm going to explain, hopefully, in the next short bit of time, why I think that that is absolutely true. And I'm going to say that from the perspective that um, this is me in Austin, Texas, in the end of October 2010. I was standing in a group of people, very much like you, um, and the people who brought me in to speak didn't know what I was about to say. But I told them, I said, you know, I've spent the last days with your shelter people, um, and I believe that you're not only going to get to know people, you're going to get there much sooner than you think. It's going to be a matter of weeks, not years. And like, their, their faces went white, their jaws dropped open. But you know what? That was October. The end of November, the city of Austin, Texas announced they had achieved their first above 90% save rate, and they've been there ever since. So, you know, I believe that that's, you know, if you're in a different place, it might not be weeks, but it's, it's absolutely coming. There's no doubt that it is coming. <clears throat> and there's one other little piece of background I want to tell you um, so that you understand the position that you are in now. When I went from wildlife to animal sheltering, there was a seven year span in between there. I left wildlife rehabilitation and I became a software developer. And it turns out I had one client full time for seven years and it was these two guys. And these two guys are the number one gurus of leadership and organizational development in the world. Dr. Robert Eichinger on the right Dr. Mike Lombardo on the left. And they talk about and teach and measure and assess leadership development and organizational change. And one of the things that they taught me is that there, if you look at organizational change and community change, there's only a handful of what they call um, change archetypes. Um, like I said, they all kind of follow the same path. I first started thinking about that when I was thinking about these communities that change and their model for these archetypes of change. And I can tell you, I guarantee Pueblo is following 100% in the footsteps of every other community that has changed before it. And it looks something like this. This is the past. This is the information stage all through here. And that's that's the work of the folks like No Kill Colorado and Reform Pueblo Animal Services. That's, you know, back here, nobody knew that there was anything you could do different. And these folks are bringing new information. It's bubbling up. It's, you know, the chieftain is talking about it. It goes on and on. It can go on for years, literally years, in Lake County. One advocate that you'll meet in a little bit, literally, it was practically his full-time job to you know, keep the sheltering issue in front of the county commissioners for five years. And then it transitioned over here into that information became awareness. They absorbed the information. The paradigm began to make sense in their heads. And when it gelled in their heads, they were able to finally, at the very end, make that decision. And so when that decision is finally made, that's when the light flip switch switches. It, it happens that fast. And all of this work, uh, all of that years of struggle and work is critical to get to that place. You've got to do it. And every one of these communities, if you look at the Carl Bailey's, the Leslie Campion's, the Doug Ray's, all of those people get to celebrate and be the people who get the credit for it. But in every community, there were people like the No-Kill Colorados and the Reform Pueblo Animal Services that were doing all that really grunt work, the really hard work for years before that. In every single case, that's true. 
And all of that work is done by different people. And oftentimes, the people who are invested in the old status quo will label those people as being divisive. Because they're the ones who just keep wanting, wanting to do the old thing over and over and over. They don't want anybody rocking their apple cart, but they're, you know, apple cart rockers, yay! Um, that's what's needed. And when you hear, you know, people in the press, or you hear other animal shelters complaining about the stress or the divisiveness of the no pill movement, that's where it comes from. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the programs that are in the no pill equation. And so, if people are calling you divisive because you're being polite and professional, you can just know it's on them and not you. And these are some of the folks. Aubrey Cavanaugh, No Kill Hunstall. Um, true story. She is a paralegal whose firm works almost exclusively with municipalities, and the city of Huntsville that she was advocating with was her client. So when she was publicly making statements about Huntsville Animal Services, you can bet she was professional, she was polished, she was polite, she was really nice. What got thrown back at her, however, was the director of the shelter and other people associated with it set up a, a, a fake web Facebook page called, you know, something about the truth of or whatever. And they did things like they took Aubrey's voice out of a public service announcement they did and like made it look like it was coming out of the rectum of a monkey. So, and these are the, and these are the people who were complaining that she was divisive. I mean, let that sink in. Uh, you would not meet a nicer, smarter person than Aubrey Cavanaugh. Ryan Clinton, everybody has celebrated the Austin success story, but they forget that you know their local citywide magazine published a glossy, front cover, very unflattering caricature of Ryan Clinton in the heat of that battle. Um, you know, and people forget. They think, oh, Austin Pets Alive did it. Well, Austin Pets Alive wouldn't have been there if Ryan, Ryan Clinton hadn't done his work all those years before. And it's interesting to note, I told you I stood up in front of a group of people. At the time I said that, they had reassigned the shelter director, and there was no shelter director. They hadn't replaced her yet. And they actually achieved no pill with no director. Um, it turns out that the sabotage factor in that community involved the shelter director actually stopping vaccinating animals so that they would get sick. And she could go to the city and say, look, see, no kill doesn't work. Our animals are getting sick. And when the city figured out that she did that, they reassigned her. And immediately, they achieved no kill. She was not just resistant. She was the problem. <laughs> Um, Steve and Debbie Shank, Lake County, Florida. Who is that weirdo they're with? Wow. I already told you their story, so I'll skip right over them, but literally five years. And then, of course, your own David Smith in No Pill, Colorado. I can't tell you how many horrible things I've heard about that guy. <laughs> but we all know he's smart. He knows what he's talking about. He's polite and he's professional. And yeah, and with his backing and support, I have no doubt you're going to get there. And of course, the wonderful folks at Reform Pueblo Animal Services, uh, Reform Pueblo Animal Services, who again produced that community assessment that you absolutely should check out. Now, this is the final uh, key point. We're at a point right now where we don't know who's going to be running animal control two months from now. Um, and so we've got two paths going forward. Um, the top path, is the path, the easy path, the painless path, the celebration path, and that is uh, pause for life gets the contract. And if that happens, everybody in this room has got a fairly easy job. You have to profusely thank the city council of Pueblo for passing the Pueblo Animal Protection Act and thank the city and county for awarding the contract to pause for life and then get busy supporting. Um, there's going to be an after effect. Naysayers are going to be work coming out and trying to attack cause for life. 
they're going to try to attack No Pill Colorado. They're going to try to attack Reform Tribal Animal Services. The youth fill in and support and support and support and enjoy the fact that six months from then, that's all going to disappear. If that doesn't happen, and the status quo contractor um, is remains in place, um, it's going to be more important that you continue to be active. I know Reform Pueblo Animal Services probably is going to want to continue speaking at city council meetings. I'm guessing they may want to add more county commissioners meetings to the list because those things are very effective. And they need people to join them. They need people to support them. They need people to go and speak at those meetings. They need donations. Uh, they're just going to need to keep the pressure on because at most, that contract will be three years at most. Um, and you know there is a three month out clause in the contract. So you know just keep the pressure on. Um, because ultimately, that change in leadership is what's required. Um, and normally in a presentation like this, I wouldn't help an organization so overtly. But in this community, I have to say, um, the leadership at Humane Society of Pikes Peak Region has gone officially on record um, they're stunningly as opposing any sort of reforms. I mean, they've done it in the press, they've done it in robocalls, they've done it everywhere. They've let us know exactly where they stand um, in terms of the no population. Um, so I think they deserve that recognition. And that's all I have. Um, I, so get, be prepared to get busy and support these folks. Um, we are going to take a handful of questions. We're really tight on time. If anybody has a question, we ask that they step up to this microphone over here um, because we are videotaping this event. And then um, Shanna's going to come up here and we will collectively work to answer your questions. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Martin, could you? Oh, not on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. Um, I do have one question because I think I, I, I kind of know the answer, but I think maybe not everyone does. And I want you to talk about. Um, the, uh, you know, the resistance with the word open admission versus limited admission shelters when it comes to the medical world. Sure. Um, well, it's an interesting question, and that is, you know, one of the misnomers that is spread around by, you know, the old school shelters who want to be justified in the killing that they're doing. Um, and so they will pretend like you can't be open admission and no kill. But again, that map that I showed you is all open admission, no kill shelters. And so it's really sort of disingenuous when shelters say, well, you know, you can only be no kill if you're limited admission. Um, you know, that's just really, A, not true um, in one way. In another way, every shelter is limited admission. Pueblo Animal Services isn't going to take a stray from Denver. I mean, they limit themselves geographically and at the bare minimum. And so it's just, it's a, it's a straw man argument that they throw up in order to, you know, try to, you know, make excuses for killing. That's all it is. While you're thinking of your next question, I, I do want to extend a very warm welcome and thank you to Councilman Ed Brown, who is in the back of the room. He, yes. Thank you for joining us tonight, but also thank you for being a champion for No Kill and Pablo. Uh, Councilman Brown was instrumental in getting Papa passed and introduced, so thank you for being here, and thank you for being with us through this whole journey. We really appreciate your support. If there's no other questions, I say help yourself to some, oh, come on up. Uh, when Pike Speak Humane Society came before council, they stated that this, uh, there were other, they had other shelters come in and say this wasn't possible. So how many 
stuff that the Colorado are okay. Boy, I don't have the exact number, but it's all those that are on the map. Well, that's not how many are no-kill. Those are the open admission municipal no-kill shelters. And Colorado is the largest cluster. You have more open admission no-kill animal shelters in Colorado than any other state in the country. So for somebody, there's two options. If somebody tells you it's not possible, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you. And because they're all over, you've got an open admission no-kill shelter in Fremont County that has the highest live release rate just about of any shelter in the United States, and they're right next door to you. <laughs> Thank you. And Colorado is really blessed. We have over 250 shelters and rescues, and so you nailed it when you talked about the importance of rescue groups and working with them, and that's something we haven't seen with our current contractor. And if they did that, overnight, we can actually start seeing no kill numbers. Right, yep. And it's worth noting, you know, I, it's, it, I haven't said it overtly, I, it's implied loudly, but if the transition doesn't happen, if that light switch doesn't get flipped, um, you're going to be stuck in this struggle, this stress mode, this fighting mode until it happens. Because no-kill, it turns out, is not what's divisive. What is divisive is killing healthy and treatable animals with tax dollars when the public doesn't want you to. That's divisive. And that's where the divisiveness comes from. That's where the division comes from. When that stops, the fight stops. And the people who made it happen get celebrated as heroes. Leslie Cabione in Lake County, Florida, that lady could run as governor right now. She's so popular. People love her. I mean, and same thing happened in Austin, Texas, everywhere. Those folks aren't necessarily the ones who did all the hard work of Reform Buffalo Animal Services or No Kill Colorado, but they're the ones who get to take the victory lap. <laughs> We're happy to do the hard work and let them do that if we're saving more healthy and treatable animals. Very good. How, how are we doing on, do, do, are they going to kick us out of here like at any second now? Okay. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I'll stay here as long as there's people wanting to talk. Okay. By the way, thank you for coming. Um, okay. My name is Debbie Graham Kainos, for those who may not know me, and I am part of the federal um, you know what I'm talking about, reform group. <laughs> but anyways, my question is this, because with the work that you've done with some of the other communities that have, have been able to be successful in no kill, one of the things that I personally would like to see, I guess is there a strategy in place for the reform group, because um, I, I kind of see it waning, you know, and then if, if Pueblo Animal Shell, or HSPPR should get the contract again. I see where, I think the people that are in reform are tired after a two year battle, because that's what it feels like. It's a two year battle. And if we have to go another three years, I can definitely see where we're gonna really need some some strategy and some reinforcement to go forward. I'm just curious, what is in place to help us with that? Well, I've got some ideas, but I can't. I don't want to speak for them. I will, but I will say this: um, that that phenomenon of struggle and then rest, struggle, and that's just part of the process. That is universal, like you know, much of the other stuff. Um, and I also believe that when Papa was passed. Um, I suspect a lot of the people at Reform Pueblo Animal Services thought their work was done. Like, victory, woohoo, we did it. Um, little did they know that all of a sudden, before it was implemented, there'd be these other little um, things that would pop up to potentially work to try to derail Papa before it was even implemented. And so now they're realizing, I believe, if you don't tell me if I'm wrong, but their work isn't done until it's done. And I think that they've been gearing up, and, and I suspect that um, if Humane Society of Pikes Peak Region continues with the contract, and just the amount of killing that we've seen, I would say, in the last you know, couple of weeks, that's been fairly public. I mean, if that keeps up, um, I suspect 
each one of those deaths is a rallying cry, and you know they'll step up. I'm sure they will. I was just curious because I, I definitely think the strategy needs to be put in place, and I definitely want to be part of that that continuing support system. But definitely, if you to be losing, I need to be strategy. Well, thanks so much. And thank you, Debbie. You've been instrumental in this. There are so many faces here tonight that have been instrumental in this and, and could be up here answering your questions or fielding them with you. We've had an incredible team. It's been a long call, and there have been times where you know, some of us have had to step back for a little bit. You know, life happens. We understand that. But we've had a great team that has continued the momentum over and over. And I remember, I think it was Quinn who said at the very first meeting uh, two years ago in March that those at the table today the majority won't be here at the end of this because it is hard and it gets very wearing and there's all kinds of, you know, just hurdles that we have to overcome. And she was absolutely right. A lot of the people that were there that day aren't, aren't with us, you know, actively pursuing this, but we've brought in so many more great people along, along the way. And it also, to quote Quinn again, time and talent I think is really key. It's figuring out who can best do what and when, and that's something we'll have to evaluate moving forward.